for many years I was stuck on install and I say stuck because I never really had anybody mentoring me on how to go about learning diagnostics. I had to learn completely on my own and that struggle was very real. It was hard to do. Uh, but eventually what I learned is that there's three main components in learning how to diagnose systems. Uh, you have to learn how to read schematics. You also have to learn the sequence of operation in what order do components turn on and turn off. Then of course there's learning how to use a multimeter and the different functions that are available on it. But before I can learn all that, what I really needed to learn was how a circuit is structured and how they actually work. Without learning that first, the other things were not possible. So what we're looking at here are what I consider to be the four main components of your average alternating current circuit, which is gonna make up the bulk of what you're looking at in residential applications. There are DC circuits out there, especially in mini splits, but we'll get to that later. So what we have here is a power source. That is your power coming in off the street, goes to your electrical panel, goes through a breaker, and enters a circuit. You have mechanical components, so these are things like motors, compressors, solenoid valves, things that generally create mechanical motion to make things happen. Now, it doesn't always have to be mechanical motion. Sometimes we generate heat, such as in electric heaters, or light in the case of light bulbs, obviously. Um, but the whole point here is that this component is gonna be something that converts energy into some useful end product that we can use. We have control components. These components are designed to turn our mechanical components on and off when we want them to. And of course you have conductors, which are the wires themselves that connect all these components together. Now the whole purpose of a circuit is to provide a path from the power source to the control components via a wire and eventually make its way back to the power source again. So what we're talking about here is a full circle, a path for electricity to travel around the entire circuit and back where it started. And so what a complete circuit does is it allows electricity to move. It puts electricity in motion. If we don't have a complete circuit, electricity cannot move. And without that motion, we can't convert that moving electricity into some useful end product, whether it's a spinning motor, a contactor that pulls in, a solenoid that activates, a heater that eats a room, or a light bulb that lights the way for us in the night. So when I talk about moving electricity, what I'm really talking about here is current. And so in order to get that current, we need the electricity to be able to travel full circle through the circuit. When you're performing diagnostics on any kind of an HVAC system, you're generally looking for one of two types of problems that are going to interrupt these circuits. So you can have either direct shutdowns of the circuit due to problems directly related to the circuit itself. So this could be improper voltages, improper resistance values, shorts in the wiring. You could have bad windings in a mechanical component. You can have a control component that maybe is not functioning properly like a bad thermostat, but whatever it is, it's directly related to the circuit itself. You can also have intentional shutdowns of the circuit, and this would be situations where the problem has nothing to do with the circuit itself. It's actually external, but some safety device is wired into the circuit designed to shut the circuit down under those circumstances. So we're talking about uh, high or low pressure situations in your refrigerant lines, thermal overload switches that will shut the circuit down on very high temperatures, flame rollouts. I mean, there's a variety of safety devices that will shut circuits down due to problems that have nothing to do with the circuit at all. But even those external problems, they can still be detected through the circuitry itself. So for example, on a furnace, you might have a thermal overload switch shutting the circuit down due to really high temperatures, and that's generally an airflow problem. But we can detect that it is a thermal overload to begin with by testing thermal overload switches, seeing if we have power across them. They should always be closed, so if you find one that's open, we know it's, uh, and it's an intentional opening of the circuit due to some external problem, which in this case would be an airflow issue. Now, early on, when you first start learning all this, this is all you're gonna see. Bunch of wires, you're not gonna have any clue on where to begin, let alone know to test a thermal overload switch. This is where learning the sequence of operations can really help you develop a foundation on where to start beginning testing uh, when you're walking up to a system that has problems. So for example, on a furnace, 
the sequence of operations here, and you don't have to memorize this. We get into more detail on this on other videos, but a thermostat will initiate call for heat. The inducer draft motor will begin to run. The differential and pressure that that running motor creates pulls in a little diaphragm and a safety switch, which closes the switch, all right? Once the control board determines that switch has been closed, it will begin to heat up the hot surface igniter that will start to glow. Once that's glowing, the control board will send out a signal to activate the solenoid in the gas valve. The gas valve opens, the flame fires up. At that point, the control board will use the flame sensor to verify there is a flame, and after a short delay, the blow motor turns on. So in knowing that sequence, if, uh, if I were to go on to a job and the furnace is going through that entire sequence, then I know uh, if the furnace shuts down after that point, that might be a good time to test that thermal overload because I know a thermal overload switch has to reach a certain temperature in order to open up the circuit and shut the things down. So that means the furnace has to run for a little while to hit that temperature. So if that's what I'm actually seeing on the job, furnace goes through its whole startup sequence and then a couple of minutes after it's running, it shuts down. That's my clue to start on the thermal overload switch. And just on a side note here, I'll add a fourth tool, um, aside from schematic sequence of operations and using your multimeter, is actually talking to the customer, get their feedback on what the problem might be. A situation like that, I could walk in, the customer says the furnace starts up just fine, heats the house for five minutes, and then it shuts down. Uh, I'll know before I even walk up to the furnace, I may be testing that thermal overload switch. So that's another tool as well. Now, if you're still stuck on install like I was, there's a couple of things you can start doing to actually learn diagnostics before you even get into the service department. One of the things I would do is when I was done installing a system, I would go ahead, send my helper up to put the thermostat in heating mode. And what I would do is I would take my multimeter, I would put it on both wires that go to the pressure switch, for example, and I would look and see, okay, my multimeter is reading 24 volts before anything happens on the system. Um, and then I would see the thermostat called for heat, the inducer draft motor would start, and then my voltage on my multimeter would immediately go to zero. And so I learned, oh, that's what a closed switch looks like on a pressure switch. Um, and so you kind of slowly learn little things like that along the way when you have these little opportunities. You don't necessarily have to be out there in a diagnostic situation. You can learn and just see how the sequence plays out in front of you when you start a system up. Just learn and see how things are supposed to work when everything's working properly. Um, and that can kind of give you a guide on what to look for when things are not working right. Another thing I would do is I would try to kind of start learning how to read schematics. I would take the same situation, starting up a furnace after I'm done installing it. I would look at a schematic and say, all right, well, where does the inducer draft motor wires come from? And I would look at the schematic and see, oh, it goes back to a little two wire Molex plug that plugs right into the control board, for example. So what I would do is I would do the same thing. I would unplug that little Molex plug, put my multimeter on those two little prongs, send my helper up to turn the thermostat to heating mode. Uh, I'd look at my multimeter, it would read zero volts. And when the heat activated, boom, 125 on my multimeter. So now I knew, okay, well, now I'm using schematics. I'm using my multimeter. I'm seeing what I should be reading. I can now tell if, you know, I'm in a certain situation where I, I might be getting something different when there's a problem. And that's how I kind of started putting things together little by little. So uh, with that said, there are ways to start learning service even if you're on your own and not really in a service situation uh, where there's a will there's a way so hopefully that helped you guys out there'll be more videos to come on these uh diagnostic topics so hope to see you on the next one